Okay, so we're good to go. Um, well, I would just start with a lead-in by saying that my name is Michelle Marino, and I'm here interviewing John J. Becker. Is that right? John J. Becker. What's the J stand for? Joseph. Joseph, okay. And today's date is Tuesday, February 26th. Is that right? Right. <laughs> 2019. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. And I probably should have said before I turn that on, too, if at any point... Um, there's a question you don't want to answer, uh, you know, just tell me or tell me time out and I can hit pause on the recorders as well and I'm okay. happy to do that. So we'll get started just sort of easing into your childhood and, and go chronologically that way. So when and where were you born? Born right here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay. What's your birth date? March 26, 1933. Okay. What were your parents' names? My father was August Becker, and my mother was Josephine Worley Becker. Is that W-O-R-L-E-Y? No, W-E-H-R-L-E. Oh, Worley, okay. Good okay. German name. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> my grandfather came from Germany. Oh, wow. Yeah. When, when did he come over? He came over as a 18 or 19-year-old boy. Uh -huh. His whole family moved over. Wow. And... Uh, so he's, you know, <laughs> the name yeah. and the Becker name, I don't know much in the Becker lineup other than who my grandparents were because they were both deceased when I was born. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, so, you know, that's, and there are no Beckers in the surrounding area that we were related to. Huh. Although there are other Beckers in the area, but none of them were technically related. It's, closely that anybody knew each other. Sure. Well, you just sort of answered my next question of where your family's from. So your mother's side came from Germany, Germany. right? But you don't have any sense of where the Beckers are from? Well, I know they Germany. came from Germany, but two generations earlier. Okay. So. Okay. Um, well, what were your parents' occupations? My father was a plaster. Okay. And, uh, he plastered many of the buildings in Fort Wayne and elsewhere. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Did he work for a company or was he yeah, self-employed? Or he worked for many companies. Uh -huh. He was the president of the Plasters Union here in Fort Wayne, uh -huh. and uh, he he did the artistic work. You've been to the Embassy Theater? I haven't. Oh, okay. okay. Well, up around the uh -huh. main, you know, floor area, that's all his artistic work wow. there, make all the pieces and put them on the walls. And, okay. and he also did the Fort Wayne National Bank building downtown mm -hmm. and many others, but he even did our house. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so a wide range of work there. Yeah. Um, did your mother work outside of the home or what did she do? Uh, she did up until her got married and had uh -huh. family. Uh -huh. She was the head of the business department of General Electric here in Fort Wayne. Oh, yeah. And she was one of the highest rated women in the company at that time. Wow, okay. I inherited from her. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, so did you have any siblings then? I had five sisters and two brothers, one older and one younger. The older brother died uh, less than a year old. He got pneumonia, and in those days they didn't have all the medicines and things. So I grew up in the middle of a family. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah, so you you fell smack dab in the middle of the? Well, as middle as you can be for eight. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, fair enough. Um, and what was the age range of your oldest? Uh, let's oldest? see, my parents were uh, married in 1925. My first sister was born in 26. I was born in 33, and my okay. youngest sister was born in uh, 41. Okay. Um, well, how would you describe your childhood? Well protected. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Yeah, well... <laughs> I, I couldn't do anything without getting in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got a lot of eyes on you. Too many eyes on me, yeah. 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 Okay. And where did you grow up in Fort Wayne? South uh, Fort Wayne, directly south at, by Harrison Hill Elementary School and St. John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. where went to kindergarten at uh, Harrison Hill, transferred over to St. John's then, and went to the Catholic grade school. Yeah. Was your family Catholic then? Yeah. Okay. Who would 
would you say were the most influential people in your childhood? Uh, most influential? Probably my parents and uh, neighbors who kept an eye on me and, okay. and you know, just generally growing up in that era. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, I grew up during World War II mm -hmm. and uh, so, it, you know. Well, that, I was going to ask you a little bit about that. You were probably about eight or so when the war started? Uh, Yes, I was eight when yeah. it started. Do you remember anything about that, or what? How did the war affect your childhood? Yeah, the war itself didn't, you know, have any basic effect on me, other than I had uh, uncles who were drafted and went off to the service. I had uh, friends, uh, not really my age group, but friends who went to the service. Uh huh. And uh, well, I finished. Uh, grade school in 47 and the war had been over for two years and so you know I'm just a little kid. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember rationing or anything like that? Yeah I even have a ration book stamp. <laughs> oh, That's neat. Uh -huh. it's, uh, yeah. So it didn't drastically affect your immediate family in any no, particular other than, way? Other than uh, sliced meat was so thin you could see both sides of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, well, what understanding, if any, did you have about your family's politics or your family's political beliefs as a young child? My mother and father never got involved in any of that. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather owned a tavern, and he was involved in, in both parties because you had to keep <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Harmony with the police and all that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, did you have any sense that they were one political party or the other? Or? Um, back then, all Catholics were Democrats, uh -huh. basically, and I was a Democrat until uh, I got involved in politics and and uh, with my wife and all. Uh -huh. And because of the people that were involved here in the Democratic Party. They pushed us to the Republican Party because we were pro-life and, and uh, equal rights and all those kind of things. And, and so, it, you were equal rights or not equal rights? For equal rights. For equal rights. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, well, as a child growing up in Indiana or Fort Wayne in particular, what were your views about the state of Indiana or being a Hoosier? Did you think about that at all? Not really. Uh -huh. <laughs> my mind was just on having fun and playing with the neighbors, and, uh -huh. you yeah. know, until I got into high school, and yeah. then you know I started getting more involved with things and mm -hmm. so on. But. Sure. Um, so you mentioned that you went to elementary at St. John the Baptist, mm -hmm. is that right? Okay. Right. Um, which was a parochial school. Right. Where did you go to middle school or junior high and then high school? Well, in those days, it was just eight grades of elementary and then four years of high school. Okay. And, uh, so what high school then did you attend? Central Catholic High School, okay. downtown. Okay. And when, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it's torn down now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what year did you graduate? 1951. 1951. Okay. How would you describe your experiences in school? I remember walking into the school for the first time and a, a sister who was the principal came up to me and she says, I know you, John. You had two sisters that went through here and they were good students and we expect a lot out of you. <laughs> What'd you make of that? <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I was just an average student. Mm -hmm. We had a class that uh, we had 400 freshmen. You know, at eighth grade, by the time we graduated, we had 282 graduates out of that. But 40 or 50 of them went across the street to Central High School for vocational classes that we didn't have and so on. So it wasn't like they all dropped out of school, it just uh, you moved, know, around a bit. moved around. Sure. And, uh, Did you have a favorite subject in school or involved in extracurriculars? No, I was involved in athletics and extracurricular. 
uh, the favorite subjects were math and sciences. That makes um, sense. Yeah, that's why I became a math and science teacher. <laughs> sure. When did you start playing football? Yeah, freshman year. Freshman year. Okay. Well, actually, I started in the sixth grade uh -huh. with elementary teens. Uh -huh. We played the other schools in town. Did you get involved with other sports, or was football sort of your main one? Uh, I played basketball also. Uh -huh. uh, my freshman year, I went off for the basketball team, and the coach cut me after two practices and said, John, you're too short. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, I was just barely over five foot six. Yeah. And yeah. then the next year and a half, I grew up six inches, and I was six foot tall. <laughs> I bet he reconsidered that, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so, um... So where did you go after high school when you graduated? Well, fortunately, our high school football teams were state champions in football. Of course, that was no, they didn't have playoffs. They just had the you know, sports writers voted us in. But we opened the season against uh, South Bend, Washington, which was the state champion the year before. And we beat them. And immediately, all eyes were on us because we were beating the state champion. And we went ten games undefeated. Wow! And so we were elected as the state champ as the state champions. Uh -huh. And uh, I got an athletic scholarship to Notre Dame. And I went there one year, and I saw that Notre Dame was not my social life and that I'd grown up in. My roommate came to school. His chauffeur brought him. His chauffeur carried his suitcases up for him. And you know that this wasn't me. <laughs> so I uh, transferred to Xavier of Ohio for one semester, and uh, they didn't want to give me an athletic scholarship. So I said, "Well, then I can't come." So I came home and worked for two years. And during that time, I was a construction worker, and from my dad's experience and all, and friends that parents own construction companies so I got into that and uh, then I got drafted in 1953. Um, the group from Fort Wayne ended the Korean War because they knew we were coming. <laughs> Good for you guys. <laughs> they, 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 well we were in basic training in the final week of basic training we had orders to go to San Francisco to get on boats to go to Korea. Well, while we were out there in our last week, they had the ceasefire. So immediately, you know, stop. We don't need more people over here. <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, excuse me a minute while I go get yeah. a drink. Go ahead. <laughs> just cut me. Yeah. <laughs> Anything to drink or anything, just stop us and we'll get okay. it. Okay, sure thing. I got some water right here. Okay, well, so uh, when I was in basic, they uh, said uh, you had experience in engineering, mm -hmm. so we're going to put you in the artillery and let you teach the surveying and fire control. Mm -hmm. And so I that's what I did for the remainder of my two years. Is, is, Acted like a sergeant, but I was only a private. Uh -huh. And uh, but that's what got me interested in teaching. That. That's interesting. So when I came home, I went to Purdue, started here in Fort Wayne when it was downtown, mm -hmm. and uh, that's when we I got married, okay. and uh, moved down to Purdue. Then my second year, and went out for the football team, and got two years of scholarship, so wow. I could afford to go there. So you, did you play the? Last two seasons. Uh, well, I, I I was on the team. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so, but, uh, um, well, a couple of things in there. If we could jump around just a little bit, um, were you expecting to get drafted, or was you know did you anticipate that happening? Or uh, I assisted in it happening because I went down and said I can't get a good job. I can't do anything. So, will you get me on the 
list and send me in. So that's how I got drafted. Okay. Yeah. And then, so for the remainder of the time when you were teaching in mm -hmm. the Army, w were you in San Francisco the whole time, or did you get shipped elsewhere? Well, I was at ca uh, Camp Fort Lewis, Washington, okay. the Army base there. Okay. And uh, so I was there, you know, for almost a year and a half. And that's all I did there. Sure. So we're then discharged in 1954? Or? 50, well, I went up there in, in uh, November of 53 okay. and got out in 55. I went in on April the 28th of 53 and got out on April the 27th of 55. <laughs> Two years to the day. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, I feel like I'm probably jumping ahead of myself here, but you mentioned getting married sort of in that time period too. So when and where did you meet your wife or future wife? She was a Central Catholic student. I recognized her in my freshman year. Uh -huh. In fact, I asked who she was. Our senior year, we shared a locker. <laughs> we didn't have enough lockers for everybody, so we shared lockers. Uh -huh. And. Uh, Want to really hear something funny? I do. In the junior year at the foot, one of the football games, uh, she was inviting people over to her house for her birthday party, mm -hmm. and I heard it. So we, I and two friends went over to her house for the birthday party. Knocked on the door. She opened the door and she says, "I didn't invite you," and closed the door. <laughs> <laughs> so two weeks later, I asked her for a date. <laughs> Did she say yes to that one? Oh yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So through the end, through their junior and senior year, we dated. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and her name was Jean. Pardon? Jean was her Jean. name. Jean. Jean. And what was her maiden name? Bobay, B-O-B-A-Y. Okay. And is her family from Fort Wayne then, presumably? Yeah. 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 There were two okay. Bobay brothers that came to Fort Wayne in eighteen in the nine, 1840. And all the Bobays in Allen County are descendants of those two boys. Okay. And uh, so, you know. And I'm sorry, I missed the date on that, but when did you all get married? 1955, May 14th. May 14th, 1955. Yeah. Okay. So you were just getting out of the Army then? Yeah. In yeah. fact, she made all the wedding plans and everything. Uh -huh. And of course, we wrote daily. Mm -hmm. Six cents for a postage stamp. <laughs> Well, At least she, five of them a week at her right wow. now. Wow, that's and she wrote me and we kept in contact. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was she doing? Was she still here in Fort Wayne while uh -huh. you were serving? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. She worked uh, as a secretary in an office. Uh -huh. And uh, so she enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, I'm jumping around, I apologize, but oh, that's good. back to playing at Purdue, um, what was it like playing uh, football at Purdue? Who was the coach at the time? Jack Mullenkoff. Jack Mullenkoff, okay. And uh, he said, why didn't you come here in 51 out of high school? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> he was the coach then there, and I went up to Notre Dame under Frank Leahy, uh -huh. and uh, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it works out. Well. Um, so then, what was your major when you were in college? Well, I started out in engineering. Okay. And then I switched over to education, math and chemistry, and uh, so I could become a coach. Mm -hmm. So I coached for 25 years, wow. football. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, even through college and in the Army in particular, in what ways did your awareness of politics evolve? Did anything change for you at the time? No, it's just a gradual mm -hmm. change. And as I said, my wife was twisted my arm to be the political person uh -huh. because of her physical condition. She couldn't uh, put up with the problems and the stress and all. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But she could do all the planning and everything. Uh -huh. So together, for like a team, really. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Um, so you had decided after the Army then that you did want to teach and coach. Mm -hmm. um, where did you get your first job then after you were certified to teach? Uh, at Northside High School here in Fort Wayne. Okay. I taught there for nine years. Uh-huh. I was the assistant football coach and uh -huh. 
it was the we switching over to the junior high school system where it was eight four four or eight yeah eight four four mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, you know I was coach football mm -hmm. and uh, that's when I took up refereeing basketball to, for a little extra money uh -huh. you know and be involved and uh -huh. all but uh, Did you have, I, I know you did because you showed me a picture, but um, when were your children born? Um, Tim was born, we were married in 55. Mm -hmm. Tim was born in July the 5th, 1956. Okay. My daughter Julia was born October the 5th, 1957. Okay. And uh, so yeah. Close they day. went through Purdue with me. Did they? <laughs> so did you live on campus? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Married student apartment. Uh-huh. Well, how did your family then sort of influence your education or your career? I mean, I'm assuming you didn't have a sort of typical college experience if, if you're taking care of kids at the same time. Yeah, well, I had two older sisters mm -hmm. who uh, both went to college, um, both up in Minnesota. <laughs> and. Uh, I am, you know, wanted to be a college student, so I came back and did all the things I had to do to keep up and and uh, make things available. Mm -hmm. And of course, in those days, college wasn't that expensive, but you could, you know, yeah. could afford it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. I think I read somewhere that you later went back and got a master's degree. Was that for your teaching right. master's, or, or what was that about? Oh, well, Indiana teaching license said you had to have five years experience and a master's degree to get your life license. Okay. And uh, so I went back to Ball State mm -hmm. to get my math license because it was much easier just to go 60 miles down to Muncie than it was to go 120 miles over to Lafayette. Sure. So I took night classes during the year and I took one uh, of the quarter system they had at that time mm -hmm. uh, down there and then come, come home and coach football in August mm -hmm. where otherwise they'd still be in classes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, how then did you become more seriously involved in politics? When did that happen? Well, happening? I became a precinct committeeman for the Republican Party okay. and uh, did all the legwork of getting people out to vote and mm -hmm. voting and getting all that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And uh, my wife pushed me to do it because she was involved with the Eagle Forum organization and they're politically involved, and so that's how we really got going. So had her, or where did Jean's interest come from? Is that something her family had been involved in, or did she just get into it herself? She just got into it herself. Her, 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 her parents were very, don't bother us with all that political <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> so she wasn't following anyone's Well, footsteps my parents or... were the same way, yeah. you know, they didn't. Yeah. At all about, about politics, uh -huh. and so had she, it had she gravitated towards the Republican Party earlier than you, or is mm -hmm. that something you kind of came yeah, to I together? Guess, I guess I tagged along with her, but she's the one that guided us and started us, uh -huh. and uh, oh, that's uh -huh. where we got going. Okay. Um, I feel like the answer to this question may just simply be your wife, but what shaped your political outlook? I guess our religious views, okay. uh, particularly being pro-life, mm -hmm. and uh, she had two miscarriages, and, and that of course made us more aware of the, you know, the child and all, uh -huh. and uh, so it was a common. Was Jean Catholic as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess you both are at the Catholic yeah. high school, so okay. Um, well, as you initially became involved in politics, even if that's precinct committeeman or, or what have you, 
were there specific issues or legislation that you were championing or fighting against even before you got into the legislature? Um, nothing particular I got to point out is that it's just the overall view of the Republican Party and, and the, the, the Democrats in Fort Wayne who pushed some things to the extreme that, you know, we, we can't do that, you know. Uh -huh. It's against our faith and against our, all we believe in. Okay. Well, what are some examples of that? I mean, you've said that a couple times that the Democrats were going sort of in a hard direction, at least locally here. Right. Where did you see them going? Um, I don't know if I can point out one or two, but, you know, just the overall stand of the Democratic Party here and, and uh, Republican Party. Did you see that that was changing from the past or were just your ideas changing too? Well, I guess it'd be both, but mainly the uh, our ideas were changing and we just could not say, get in line with the Democratic Party again. Okay. And again, just because you've said this a couple times, like specifically in Fort Wayne, were you paying attention to national politics or were you more just focused on what the Democrats were doing locally? Uh, national projects. Okay. Rather than, you know, because so many of my friends who were Democrats uh -huh. were having thoughts too about what the party was doing nationally and, you know, uh -huh. so we joined together. <laughs> okay. So a disconnect between national politics and local politics right, is making yeah. you and others question yeah. what was going on. Okay. Um, so at this time then, uh, who were your national political heroes, if any? Well, I was a John Kennedy supporter uh -huh. and uh, I always liked his quotation, ask not what your country can do, but what you can do for your country. And this is where I think, you know, the Democrats on the national level also got split up and caused a break away. And uh, so it's just a combination. Mm -hmm. okay. Again, as you're sort of getting involved in local politics, or about when did you become a precinct committeeman? Oh, that would have been probably in the late 70s, early 80s. Okay. Did you have any um, state or local politicians that you were campaigning for, that you advocated for, or looked up to in the 70s and 80s? Not particularly, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well, what then made you finally decide to run for state government? Or did you have other levels before you went from precinct committeeman to the legislature? Uh, I ran for uh, Allen County Council one time. Okay. And, uh, it, of course, it's a big, wide area. and My name wasn't that well known on, in, in politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... I, I ran twice for two different counts, once for the district seat and once for a general mm -hmm. uh, at large seat. And uh, just then the combination of people that we got involved with and got you know more and more involved mm -hmm. in the, it, it, I agreed to take over the, the area to be the precinct committeeman and so on and get the workers or the party and all that. You know, mm -hmm. Just so. You know, you start slow and you get going. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Um, well, then, what made you decide to finally run for the General Assembly? Um, ben Giaquino was the, Repu or the Democrat, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm the only one that beat one of the Dem uh, Giaquinos in an election. I beat his dad, you know. Uh -huh. I lost to him one time, I won the second time, and I lost the third time uh -huh. because it was a strictly Democratic district as it was laid out. It's all central Fort Wayne, mm -hmm. southeast Fort Wayne, mm -hmm. and uh, but because I was teaching 
at the Southeast School, and I grew up in the south part of Fort Wayne, and a lot of people knew me, and so my name became involved, open and involved, and, and so I got really involved in it. Okay. So you beat his father once? Yeah. For? Well, he, he's the father of, of, of Mark and uh, Phil. Okay. And Phil's down in the legislature now. Now, yeah, and his father was the right. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, what did your you know you showed me some of your campaign materials, but what did you emphasize? Why did you want people to vote for you? Um, one of the big things at that time was they were putting a uh, dump in Southeast Fort Wayne, the gar garbage dump, and that was just lowering all the value of that area. And I, hey, this has got to, you can't do that. You got to take that out to an area where it's not going to tear down the value of all the houses and everything around it. Sure. And so that was the biggest thing. Uh -huh. And it was less than a half a mile away from the high school, which is a brand new high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, you know, from then on, that area just went downhill. And uh -huh. so it's, a hard thing to see, but you, you got to stand up and fight for something, I guess, and they did. Sure, sure, okay. Um, did you have a particular, for that, uh, what probably would have been 94 uh, when you ran, mm -hmm. um, did you have a particular campaign strategy in terms of getting elected for the House? Get more votes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the basic goal, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think I knocked on two thirds of the doors in the district, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I started, you know, just knocking on doors every weekend, uh -huh. and spent time doing that. And Did your wife organize some of that? I mean, you said she was very heavily involved in this. Oh yeah, she she always helped us with uh -huh. get ready. Uh, I suppose I was a rebel rouser because uh, when I was teaching in Fort Wayne at North Side. I was uh, coaching, and the coach's salary at that time was nickels and dimes for coaching uh, 12 weeks of football. I got $200. You know, that didn't even pay for my coffee. <laughs> no. no so I, along with the other coaches, said, hey, we got to do something. This is ridiculous. I know that teacher salaries are not the highest, mm -hmm. but there's no sense in, you know, giving up all your time to do these things if you don't get some mm -hmm. award for it. So I worked with the coaches and we got it uh, to be represented by the Fort Wayne Teachers uh, Association. Mm -hmm. And they took our proposal to the school board and we got a $300 raise, wow. more than yeah. double our pay. And uh, then uh, the following year, the president of the association came down to me and said, would you serve on our salary committee? So I served on the salary committee for two years. Mm -hmm. And the second year, we went on teacher strike wow. to get the same kind of situation for the mm -hmm. teacher salary that uh -huh. we've gotten for the coaches. Uh -huh. And uh, so I was the salary committee chairman the year that Fort Wayne teachers went on strike. Okay. And that was 1967. Wow. So you were getting some involvement that way as yeah. well. So sure. that's how I got my feet wet in the sure. political area. Because mm -hmm. yeah, it was political. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know. Well, you had also said, so you taught at North, North Side, right? North Side. Uh, for nine years. Where did you go after that? Heritage opened. Okay. Combined Monroeville and Hoagland schools. Okay. And uh, so I coached and taught out there for five years. Mm -hmm. And then Harding opened. Okay. And I got the head football coaching job at Harding. Okay. And so I was involved there for seven years. Okay. And uh, whenever you get your head in the noose and they hang you, <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, you also have to watch your backside. And uh, they didn't fire me from Northside, 
but they took away all my extracurricular things. That's the reason I went to Heritage. And when I got to out to East Allen, the superintendent called me in, and we had a nice conversation. I said, "Hey, I don't look for trouble, but I'm not going to stand around and, and yeah. things are going uh -huh. badly to let it keep going." And do you mean with teaching or with football? With football. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. I mean, with teaching, you know, you're in the classroom sure. and nobody even knows what you're doing in yeah. the classroom. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's a different field, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed it. And mm -hmm. so the superintendent gave me the head football job over at Harding when it was open. Uh -huh. And uh, so I did that then for seven years. Okay. And, uh, my principal came to me one time and said, last year you won seven ball games, and this year you won none. He said, you, think you can't do that. And I said, sir, we have one public junior high feeding Harding High School. All the Fort Wayne schools have three junior highs feeding the high school. We just don't have the numbers and the talent. You know, mm -hmm. so you do, you know, I said, well, you know, you can fire me now. You can wait and fire me later. <laughs> yeah. Won't make me any difference. Sure. Because I say I can win three games next year if we're lucky. Yeah. We won four. <laughs> <laughs> but they fired me anyway. <laughs> so was that your last teaching and coaching at Harding or did you go elsewhere after that? I stayed at Harding. To teach, but you didn't right, coach anymore. Right. Okay, and so when did you retire from teaching? The year after I got elected. Okay. 1995. Okay, okay. okay. Um, well, I know that you defeated, narrowly defeated, uh, Benji Aquinta. Was there a lot of Republicans that were running against each other first? Oh, well, there were just two of us in the primary. Okay, and who was the other person? Do you remember? Been a while, I yeah, know. can't think of his name right now. But anyway, yeah, there were just the two of us, and he had never done anything before, and his, he didn't really have a name. Yeah. And uh, so, I I won the primary without a problem. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And and I know I could look this up too, but at that point, how long had Gia Quinta been serving? Uh, ben had been in for four years. Okay. Okay. And uh, so. Uh, he and I didn't see eye to eye. <laughs> the funny thing is that when I first met Ben Giaquina, his name was Quinn. Hickson Quinn Real Estate Company. <laughs> Giaquina was too long a name and too, you know, controversial. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I even razzed him about it. Hey, Ben. I knew you when you were Quinn. <laughs> when did you change your name? Yeah. Uh, what made you decide to run for a House seat as opposed to the Senate? Uh, the, it's a smaller district, so you better easier to get acquainted, and mm -hmm. and you really have to have a known name in the Senate because the only it's a Senate seat, you know, it takes up usually two or three full house areas and sure. so you know you really have a, a chore to do mm -hmm. yeah so you felt it was more manageable to start right. with the house okay right. and who i would have had to run against to defeat to get up to, into that sure sure okay um well what was most important to you as a candidate when you were starting your campaign to run for the house seat who or what was it? What, what was most important to you? Was there, I mean, you mentioned the dump. Is that kind of what you ran the yeah, platform the, on? Or? Right. The dump was one of the main issues that I ran on. Okay. Well, how did you get that message out to the public? You mentioned going door to door, but did you have other campaign materials? or? Well, uh, the mayor of Fort Wayne didn't like the dump either, so I got him and he was a Democrat. And so the two of us would talk about it together, you know, and so it was how a lot of it was done. Okay, okay. Yeah. What was election day like for you? Well, 
as I did all the work myself, putting the signs out and all that kind of stuff, you know, and then going from pole to pole and shaking hands with people to be sure and vote for me and so on. And then uh, my campaign manager, who was a House member the year before but wasn't running again, uh, he advised my wife and I what to do and everything. And when I when I closed the polls on election day, started picking up all my signs, uh, I could feel it, you know, it was a very tight race. And when they started giving the results uh, through the evening, he was always ahead of me. And uh, so uh, I was out picking up the, the polling signs and, and uh, my Mitch, my friend, uh, called and said, hey, I got word from the election board that you're beating Ben. And so I started <laughs> going around and finishing my job. And uh, the next day, it was still undecided. And, you know, and uh, so when it finally came out that uh, I won by six votes, he immediately challenged and wanted a recount. So we had a recount and he won by six or seven votes. And so the Republican Party pushed me to go all the way to the state for a recount and I won in the, in the, on the third recount. <laughs> wow. Did you anticipate it being such a close race? Oh yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. so you kind of knew. Even, even old friends from where I grew up in the south end of town. Uh -huh said, we'd like to job, vote for you, but you're a Republican and we're Democrats. Mm -hmm. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, so, I guess, like, normally you would know by the end of the day who oh, yeah. won. So, did you anticipate it dragging out, or did you think, well, tomorrow morning it'll be settled? Well, yeah, I thought, you know, when we heard the first results, yeah. but when there's only a six count difference, you know, <laughs> immediately everybody says recount. Yeah. And the funniest thing is that my own precinct, they recounted it. They'd made an error in the tally, and I got uh, six votes out of that revote tally in my own precinct. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so how long did that drag out then? Until December. Wow. And uh, so I was, you know, pins and needles, am mm -hmm. I going to go back to mm -hmm. teaching after Christmas or am I going to go down to... Yeah. Well, and how did you work that out with your school? Were you going to take a semester I take, take, off? Or? Take a, you know, uh, I don't know what they call it, not sick leave, but a, yeah. for political purposes, you know, you yeah. get approved to do that mm -hmm. and uh, in fact I had things all laid out mm -hmm. for my substitute teachers uh -huh. on how to finish the semester and and of course that's in late January right. and so you know I come back to work with the substitutes and uh -huh. weekends. Wow. Um, so when you finally got the official word that you had won. I think I read somewhere, had you already been sworn in as that was still ongoing or no? No, no, we didn't get sworn in until, well, because usually they, a they had a, a, an organization meeting in yeah. November, but I, I wasn't uh, officially a member then. I okay. attended, but I wasn't sworn okay. in. So you did go, but right. it, it wasn't official. Yeah. Okay. And then to jump back, you had said there was a former member of the House that had given advice to you and your wife. Who, who was that? <laughs> Mitch Harper. Okay, Mitch Harper. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you go to Organization Day, you finally find out in December that mm -hmm. you won the seat right. by a handful of votes. What did you find or what were you thinking as you actually walked into the State House that first day in January? No, well, I was just, you know, flabbergasted by what was going on because I was just a little pin in the whole thing. Uh -huh. And, and, uh, but in, in fact,
fact, uh, on the first day of, organ of being down there, mm -hmm. I was uh, put on the education committee as vice chair. Uh -huh. And the chairman came up to me and he said, John, I have a bill and I have to hand over the gavel to you to run the meeting. And so I said, oh, okay. And so we get into the meeting and he calls it to order and he says, the first bill is mine and I'm turning the gavel over to John Becker, the vice chairman. And so he handed it to me and I proceeded to follow the rules and regulations as we went through it. And then uh, that afternoon we had a, a party meeting mm -hmm. and we were told, you know, now be ready to, to do these jobs and, and we're going to have a meeting for all you in new freshmen mm -hmm. on how to conduct business meeting. I said, it's a little late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody laughed. Yeah. That's funny. Well, how did you get the vice, vice chair position right as you were coming in? Because you had been a teacher or? Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because the chairman was not a teacher. Okay. Okay. And uh, there's only one other teacher, I think, on the committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's just a matter of here you are you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah getting your feet wet yeah. right away so yeah. um well how then did you learn the ins and outs of state politics well it's a lot of it is just being willing to listen and and uh, move forward with whatever you know the party line is that you're trying to to build up because at that time, you know, it's it's just a matter of Republican versus Democrats. You want to do it this way, but we want to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to do all the bargaining to, uh -huh. to get things done. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, did you have any political mentors as you sort of settled into the General Assembly? Not really, no. no. Okay. Well, obviously, at this point, you're sort of firm re Republican, but you ran on the Republican ticket. What did the Republican Party stand for, in your opinion, during that time, mid '90s? Uh, I don't know whether I can, put, you know, voice my thoughts on that very well uh, without giving us some really long thought, but uh, <laughs> it's, okay. uh, it's, you know, it's, the party is, you know, uh, has basic ideas of, of how we should tax people, mm -hmm. how, who you should tax and how much and, and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, so that is one of the big things, you know, you don't want to overtax, but you don't want to not be able to do things. Right. So you have to have some taxes. Sure. And uh, so that, I think that was the, the biggest issue mm -hmm. that we fought over. Okay, okay. Um, how did you know the needs and wants of your constituents then? Well, I held a couple of, bo of meetings, mm -hmm. you know, uh, down, you know, at the various locations in the area. At, mm -hmm. uh, the high school, you know, there we got the room and got the people to come in, and, and uh, we uh, met at other places, uh, churches or wherever in the area, and announced that we were going to be there and what we wanted to talk about. And if you have any questions, bring them to us, and we will, you know, help take uh, care of the things that you need to be, have done. Mm -hmm. Um, did people write you letters or call you about issues or? Oh yeah, you, yeah. All the time, we got I get uh, letters and so on, and I, I always give it to my secretary. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's funny. Um, you had mentioned earlier too that you and your wife went down to Indianapolis. Did you? Where did you stay, or how did that work? Uh, there's an apartment complex just uh, one block uh, north and uh, west of the Capitol building. Okay. And we got a, a room in there and there were probably half a dozen legislators in there. Mm -hmm. 
it was ideal for uh, couples to be there because some of the guys, you know, would get a motel room and their parents, their wife and family didn't come down so right. they could stay in the room. But, we, you know, we wanted to be relaxed and, and yeah. uh, have it in there. So obviously, with the, the diary you showed me, your wife kept really good track of what was going on. How did she mingle with other people? And what was she, it like for her? She enjoyed it. Did she? Uh -huh. <laughs> she really enjoyed it. And uh, she worked with, you know, like I said, uh, she was a member of Eagle Forum mm -hmm. and the state uh, president uh, the year before we went down. And she gave it up in order to have more time and not being crisscrossing with all the things. Sure. And uh, so, you know, we, she even held meetings in our apartment. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> she was busy, certainly. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. As you read through that, yeah. you'll see she was uh -huh. involved. I think I had read at some point there was like a... Uh, legislators' wives' club or something like that was was that still around when you were in there? Um, I don't know if it was a legislators' wives' club, but the the wives of legislators got together for a luncheon and mm -hmm. did things, you know, together. So there was interaction. Yeah, there, there was interaction. Spouses. Okay. Um, so you were just talking a little bit about how you knew the needs and wants of your constituents. They would call or send letters mm -hmm. that you would then give to your secretary and um, other things. Um, but how did you communicate and interact with them? Like when the session was over, would you, you held some meetings, but were there other ways that you communicated with them? Not that I could say that I did specifically yeah. to do it, no. Okay. Uh, do you remember the first bill you sponsored? Uh, actually, I did not sponsor a bill of my own. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a Senate bill, and the, the sponsor of it asked me to carry it in the House, and okay. I did. That okay. was the Senate bill from John Sinks. Okay. And, uh, was so, that the one that went through then? Yeah. It, and what, what what issue was that around, or what was the law about? <laughs> I have to get it to <laughs> read it. I can look at that later. <laughs> I mean, that's 25 years yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, well, I know that, I think maybe both in the first and second session at least, but you were involved in educational testing issues. Um, like trying to get rid of I step or change. Um, well, we were just putting I step in. Okay. Yeah. Um, Making requirement that the schools, uh, you know, test to make sure that the students knew a certain level of uh -huh. all all uh -huh. subjects. You know, I mathematics. You can do a level of math at different things. When you got social studies, history, mm -hmm. where do you take and one year you know like well even in our schools the junior year you have u.s history mm -hmm. and the senior year you have government and sociology classes which they consider the, the equivalent and but freshman and sophomore years you could have any year, century of history right and it's hard to test that uh -huh. um, but you know you can with math Two plus two equals four, no matter what level you're at. Right, right. Um, I'm assuming you got involved in those issues because of your background as a teacher. Um, I'm sorry, did I go ahead. No, okay. And um, it seems like, and I know this was 25 years ago, so if you don't remember, please, please just let me know. But um, it it sounded like there was another test called IPASS, maybe that people were trying to put in. Do you remember anything about that? Well, they just gave it a different name because of the broadness of it and so on, but it's all been the basic mathematics, the uh -huh. basic uh, history, and the uh -huh. basic other things that were thrown in, and it's just a matter of who pre who organized the task and uh -huh. so on. It was just another name for the same thing. Okay. So you were more involved in just trying to figure out what would be appropriate testing or what you thought we should do? Right. Throughout the state. Yeah. yeah, particularly 
you know, in the social studies, we would say we're just going to do a generalization of the U.S. history, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, with math, you know, you could say this is level uh, general math algebra, mm -hmm. and uh, because most students in high school take at least general math and one semester of algebra mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so, you know, we could do that easier. Yeah, okay. Um, I also, from my research, just understood that you were involved somehow in a lawsuit that was suing the Department of Education um, related to some of this testing. Do you remember what that was about? Mm, no, I don't remember a lawsuit relating to it. It was just discussion going on back and forth, but uh, okay. there was no lawsuits. No, okay. Um, well, can you tell me a little bit more about the regular interaction amongst assembly members, both formal or informal? How did you get to know your colleagues? Well, um, one nice thing is uh, three out of five days a week they have luncheons. And some organizations pay for it. Yeah. So you go with them and you eat and you talk and there's general conversation uh -huh. about the bills or what we're working on and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, you know, you just bump elbows so much that you're constantly involved with them. Yeah. So you, you felt like you're talking about issues probably when you're on the floor and having sort of formal committee m meetings, but that right. also transpires outside right. of the. Yeah. The chambers. Okay. You, you, you know, um, when I was there, we had like 20 freshmen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you were all sharing things with each other and talking constantly about the, the bills that they're working on or their, their committee meeting they were in and what involved and let us know what you think we should do is vote for it because there is no way that you can know all the bills and all the information, although I, quote, read every bill that went through the Education Committee, uh -huh. and I uh, read all the bills that uh, I could, but uh, I couldn't do them all, or you'd be, <laughs> you'd never get <day> sleep. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Um, what were issues that you what were interactions like between the majority and the minority parties, between the Republicans and the Democrats? Oh, uh, it wasn't that big a difference between them, and so you had to go in and discuss things with them to know what their view was on a particular issue, particularly if uh, one of the Democrats on a committee with me. I'd ask him now, what does it you really want out of this bill, and, and you know, can you explain it to me in detail, uh -huh. so that uh, I don't have to read and reread the bill, and you know, as I go go through it, then I would have their viewpoint, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, they they all shared their information with you, well, you know, yeah. all the time. Sure. So did you feel like you were kind of forced to work together a little bit? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Um, what differences, if any, were there between the members of the House and the Senate? Um, I didn't know that many of the senators. Mm -hmm. I knew the ones from Allen County and sure. surrounding area, but uh, the rest of them I really didn't get to know very well unless they were on a committee with me. But. Uh, we were, you know, we didn't have intermixing of House and Senate so much as, as we just have putting together a group of, for the House in order to have committees. Mm -hmm. So even when you're going socializing or going to the luncheons, it was still pretty parceled out between House members together and Senate senators right. together. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember what your relationship was like with your seatmate? What was that again? Your relationship like with your seatmate, who you sat next to? Oh, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> the two directly to my right uh -huh. were two Allen County Republicans, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, Phyllis Pond and Gloria Gagline, uh -huh. and they were my mothers. <laughs> <laughs> so they took care of you. 
care of me. They took you're there. care of me. <laughs> That's funny. So you had some familiarity with them, yeah, too. Right. Okay. Of course, all the House members are divided over Republicans on one side and Democrats on the other. So we were right among all the Republicans uh -huh. and uh, being that close to those two and talking all constantly, you know. Phyllis Pond was a teacher, elementary school teacher, in East Allen where I was a high school teacher. Uh, okay. So we had a lot of things to really yeah. talk about. Sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, can you tell me a little bit about the process of generating a bill? How did, how did that transpire, if you wanted to put forth legislation or sponsor a bill? or Well, most bills are written by organizations, like the Chamber of Commerce or somebody, you know. They want something for the whole state, but they've got to have a bill to pass. Mm -hmm. So they get the information, and then they share it with you and say, would you be a sponsor on this bill? And one bill that I agreed to help sponsor, I sat down with the group and, and uh, their attorney and, and mm -hmm. discussed what it should be. And then they sent it to the legislative uh, committee of, of or the, what is it, the, it's, it's where, who writes the, the actual bill. Legislative Services Agency? Yeah, right, yeah. Okay. And uh, so, you know, you, you talk to them about what, you think it should have, and the people that were pushing you sit with you and tell you know, their viewpoints, so that it comes out as once corrected, and and uh, so you can you know take the bill to the floor. Okay. Well, how was legislative business conducted outside of formal votes or committee meetings? Did you have to say once you had a bill in place, how did you get people? to support it or to get the word out about what it was about? Um, I don't recall any particular thing other than, you know, er, you have your bill written and then uh, you talk to the people on your committee about the bill and then you share that information with others, uh, House the Republicans and House Democrats mm -hmm. to try and convince them that this is the way the bill should be handled and what it should do. Mm -hmm. and so, so did you have to sort of go around explaining that to people or would it just be like you would present it formally in front of the caucus or? Um, just present it at the caucus or okay. discuss it at the caucus. Yeah. And, uh, and okay. like I say, I only... Uh, got involved with one bill that was my own bill, and then I, with John Sinks's bill that came over, and right. I, I did it all arm twisting. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this is what we've got through the Senate, and mm -hmm. this is a House bill, and we need to get it done this way. So, mm -hmm. you know, and the one one guy, I swear, he he, he just tried to antagonize you. <laughs> There's always one of them. Yeah. 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 So did you have to really work hard to get people on your side, or did you feel like once you explained it, people would be like, oh, you know, kind of go with the flow? Well, most of them went with the flow after you got to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. But, uh, I remember, you know, on, on my own bill when I was presenting it to the caucus, I said, now this is what the, the people tell me they need to have in order to mm -hmm. conduct business and so on. And this one guy, you know, he always had this little tidbit about, well, are you sure that's what they really want? <laughs> uh -huh. and, and do you recall what that bill was? Uh, not or? right off. No, okay. <laughs> I can look that stuff up. <clears throat> Did you end up being able to advocate for not having the dump once you got into the legislature? Legislature. Well, that wasn't a state problem. That was a local problem. Okay. But uh, that you know, we we can't write a bill that mm -hmm. covers all the states. You know. Right. So it was a local problem. Mm -hmm. 
so did that help you get into the legislature, sort of campaigning on that issue, or was that just something that spurred you into that getting involved? That spurred me into it and then got it going. Okay, gotcha. Did you have a sense of how people would vote um, on a bill prior to the voting actually having taken you, place? You knew, you know, let's say 90% of the people were going to vote mm -hmm. how they would vote, but then there are always a few that, you know, yeah. don't agree with you, even if mm -hmm. uh, you say it's chocolate and they want to say, you know, it's just brown stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so was there a lot of even particularly when you're in either committee meetings or maybe even in the caucus, like internal disagreements that you all would have to hash out? Oh yeah, in the caucus we, we did. We had good debates mm -hmm. a lot of times on various yeah. things. So what would that look like? What was the atmosphere like when you would go to caucus? Um, it was, you know, very friendly usually, but then, you know, like I say, there's some people who just did not agree with you. And, uh, why why you have <laughs> that many people yeah. you only need one more than half <laughs> right. so then when you were having those debates is the ultimate goal to get everybody on the same side so then you could present a unified front against Democrats or well you know that's when you in your um, discussion party discussion you get everything ironed out mm -hmm. the best you can, and then you try to go from there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I remember that one time uh, on my bill, the person came to me and said, I'm going to uh, present a change in the bill. Uh, here's a copy of what I'm going to present. Mm -hmm. And I looked it over and I said, you know, that's going to ruin the bill mm -hmm. if you do that. And he says, well, that's what the people that I'm working with think needs to be done. I said, well, we'll have to see then how the <laughs> rest of the party agrees with you or me on yeah, that. Yeah. You know. And so then you'd have to hash that out right, yeah. amongst each other. Did any of those, for the most part, it seems like it was good-hearted debate, but did any of that conflict ever spill out of there? I mean, did people get heated and then hold grudges? or? No, I never felt any of that, no. Okay. no. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, during your tenure, what roles did party leadership play? Well, they put people on committees mm -hmm. to push a particular issue that they are for, mm -hmm. or they uh, won't bring the bill up, you know, there's all kinds of things that, mm -hmm. I mean, there's 500 bills. Yeah. <laughs> they come up and they don't all get a hearing, they don't get out of committee, and of course the, the head of the, the party mm -hmm. tells the committee head, you know, we don't want to hear your bill because we think it's just going to cause trouble, and now uh, you get it worked out beforehand you know, with a new version or something, we'll consider, but we were not considering as it stands now. So the party leadership has influence in the committees to say, kill this bill or yeah. modify it and maybe we'll send it through. So right. that's kind of how that, yeah. that goes. Okay. And, and I think, you know, when you were in a session, that was the first time in eight years or so that Republicans had full control. Right. Um, so, I mean, obviously you weren't in there before, but did that was that a sort of unique opportunity for you all to sort of push forth your agenda or, you know, certain things that you all wanted to get through that hadn't or had been stalled out for a while? Um, it's, I think everything moved along pretty evenly mm -hmm. without a big fight. And some bills would cause nothing but a fight and those would get put aside. Yeah. But, uh, Others, you know, you, you can't get all 500 bills through in a short session. <laughs> right. It's a lot of bills. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would you say the public, the general public here in Indiana, what do we not know about the Indiana General Assembly or how it operates? Um, I 
don't know whether I can give an example, but uh, you know, it's uh, like uh, we didn't have gambling before that, mm -hmm. and there were, there were groups that wanted gambling, you know, and myself. I don't think I've bought three gambling tickets <laughs> even to this day because uh -huh. I don't think that's how the state should get its money. Mm -hmm. you know, because the poor people who buy tickets are the poor people that don't have the money to buy tickets. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And being a math person, probability, I know the <laughs> possibility of you winning is very slim mm -hmm. and yeah, somebody's going to win. But, you know, there's millions of people buying tickets and only one person's going to be a big winner. Sure. So with that example, do you feel like there's just lots of issues that are sort of hashed out that people don't know the history behind, or? Yeah, I think a, a lot of people who don't follow the politics going on constantly mm -hmm. don't really understand why they do it this way or that way, you know, it's just a matter. We, we have, quote, laws that should be taken off of the books because we're no longer a horse and buggy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. So things just left there for a while. Well, how did your legislative service affect your family? Well, um, my children, uh, graduated in the 1980s, 70s to 80, and I didn't go on until 94. So you know they were, I had grandchildren uh -huh. <laughs> who who come down to see Grandpa, you know, yeah. and thought it was a thrill. Oh, I bet, I bet. Yeah. So they were generally out of the house and had yeah. families of their own. It so. didn't affect them at all. Uh huh. What about your wife? Oh, well, she ate it up. Yeah. <laughs> he really enjoyed it. You know? Um, do you recall, or what would you say were the most controversial legislative issues during your time in office? I can't pick any one big one out, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is just uh, smoothing things out. It's not new mountains that were climbing all yeah. the time. It's just little hills and things that were changing or not. Okay. Um, do you recall if there was, you know, whether it was the bill you put forth or other things that you sponsored, is there a particular piece of legislation that you worked hardest on or was most difficult for you? No, because I didn't have any agenda particularly that I was trying to push to mm -hmm. get through mm -hmm. to just you know join in where I could and yeah. smooth out the best I could yeah okay what was your proudest moment as a legislator I guess uh, when I got the John Sinks bill through the house mm -hmm. and the gang all signed my copy of the bill. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> it felt was, like you had accomplished yeah, something yeah. there. Mm -hmm. okay. And then I also enjoyed when I had uh, several people come down to be recognized by the legislature mm -hmm. and uh, you just get to introduce them and so on. Mm -hmm. It was nice. Yeah. What was committee work like? I mean, you shared the story of being jumped, you know, dumped right into that from the get-go, but I know you were on education, and then I think I saw um, natural resources, aged and aging, and maybe families, children, and human affairs. Yeah. Um, uh, age and aging, we really didn't, I think we had two committee meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, there weren't any big bills or anything to do. Okay. Uh, natural resources, of course, was just taking care of our state parks and so on. And uh, that was more formal, just to get things up to grade. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, the education committee, we had several, you know, debatable bills what we should do, and particularly since we were talking about 
the predecessor to I step and uh, I stood on how I stood on it and uh, you know being a teacher for those years mm -hmm. and uh, so you know I tried to voice my opinion mm -hmm. without upsetting everybody <laughs> yeah did you feel most comfortable on the education committee and to sort of be a leader of that because of your background I think so yeah, yeah definitely okay. Um, and I know that le party leadership appoints you to committee work, is that right? Right, yeah. Um, so obviously education is a good fit. Did you have any sense of why you were placed on any of the others? or what um, just... <laughs> <laughs> I think they went down to, here's a committee, you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, were there any major hurdles that you had to overcome during your time? As a house member, mm, not that I. If I stayed on longer, maybe. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Well, what, in your opinion, is the most important work of the Indiana General Assembly? What's the most important thing that they do? Oh. Um, that all bills treat people equally. And, uh, you know, you can't have special rules for one group and a different set of rules for another. You all have to have the same set of rules and they have to be general in such a way that it affects the whole state that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, you've got to evaluate each one as to what it says and, and who it pertains to. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's so you see that is the goal of the General Assembly to try to make sure that's the intent of legislation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, tell me a little bit about then the 1996 election, because Gia Quinta runs again against you, right? Right. Okay. So um, what was your campaign strategy like to get reelected, or did you do the same things? or? Well, I basically did the same thing. <laughs> it was mainly getting recognition of me and the people that uh, we were trying to help mm -hmm. and what we were trying to accomplish you know and, and uh, so it's you know did you do the same like go door to door or did you feel like you were better well known this time no i i went door to door uh -huh. and uh, i would spend uh, you know three to five hours every Saturday and Sunday out knocking on doors, mm -hmm. um, attending neighborhood association meetings, mm -hmm. and uh, just keeping my name and interest out in mm -hmm. front of the people mm -hmm. and let them know who I was and so on. Sure, okay. Well, what was the outcome of that election then? Oh, he beat me by a couple hundred votes. Yeah, still close. I didn't challenge him. <laughs> yeah, with that. Uh -huh. um, what, how did you feel about that? I mean, had you wanted to continue for a long time, or was this, okay, let's move on? Or Well, I wanted to, you know, feel like I could do a good job for the people and, and mm -hmm. wanted to be involved. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't sit down and cry mm -hmm. because, you know, it was, wasn't my goal all along to become a <laughs> representative. <laughs> that was something that just gradually built sure. and got involved with mm -hmm. it and did all the things that, that uh, were necessary to do it. Uh -huh. how, did, um, how did your wife respond? Oh, she took it very seriously and she you know thought we we were doing a good job mm -hmm. for the people mm -hmm. and uh, she's sorry that we didn't win and go back mm -hmm. again but uh, you know you do what you can do and when you can do it sure sure yeah okay well how would you summarize maybe you just did this but how would you summarize your time as a state legislator uh just the daily routine of doing things, you know, and and, and uh, you weren't uh, 
building new barriers or you weren't tearing down old barriers, you were just trying to do the best you could to move the bills through and work with the people. Mm -hmm. but, uh, fun and, but uh, you know, it wasn't my life that I was going to go away because I didn't get reelected. Right, right. You were yeah. able to move forward. Right, yeah. Okay. Do you have a favorite story or anecdote during your time in the General Assembly? Mm, not that I could think of right now, but, yeah. uh, you know, I'd have to make some things up. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Were there any lessons you learned about government or humanity or anything? <laughs> Well, when I was in the legislature, I got a call from St. Francis College saying they had a course they were teaching, mm -hmm. and it was in local government. Would I be willing to teach the course? And I said, yeah, I'd do that. Yeah. <laughs> tell me what all I want to cover and all, and they yeah. tell me, and I, I taught one semester of local <laughs> government. <laughs> That's fun. So, Jerome, mostly on your experiences on yeah, that work. Right. Well, and, and you know, we talked about the the city council and the the county council, mm -hmm. school boards. Yeah. And uh, the state uh, mm -hmm. election, but we did, did the other three as our primary mm -hmm. part of the class. Sure. And uh, so I made everybody go attend one of each of those meetings and uh -huh. write a report and mm -hmm. you know, one, one page report on what you did there and what went on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you feel like, well, that, that's interesting. Do you feel like either when you were serving or even today that most people know how those things work? Not really how they work, no. Uh -huh. no. Uh -huh. Only what they see on TV. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, after your defeat then for what would have been the 1996 election, mm -hmm. did you have any interest in trying to run again in the future? No. No. Okay. Um, I, I do know, and we talked about this briefly too, that you campaigned for other politicians. Oh, yeah. How did you get involved in campaign work? Well, I had a friend who was running for state representative. And uh, I sat down with him and told him what, what to expect if he got elected mm -hmm. and what he needed to do to get elected. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a good discussion several times. We'd step, meet with coffee, over coffee and so on. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he appreciated my time that I spent with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, just enjoyed doing that. And I yeah. said, now, you know, I'll help you. I'm not going to run your campaign yeah. to do all sure. the work. Sure. You know. So you still kind of stayed somewhat in the fringes of right. other people's campaigns yeah. and things like that. Okay. Well, given that you've you know lived in Fort Wayne for most of your life and born and raised here, um, but also been around the state, how would you say the state has changed over the course of your lifetime? Or, or do you think it has changed? I'm not sure I can point to anything that changed over the state mm -hmm. other than the fact that uh, because the nature of the communities change, mm -hmm. you know, the industries and everything else mm -hmm. that uh, affects it, but it's, it's a gradual change that affects everybody and it's, I don't think it's any drastic uh, changes. Okay. I don't know how closely you've stayed involved or followed up with the Indiana General Assembly, but do you think the General Assembly has changed since you served in the mid-90s? I have only visited down there a few times, you know, mm -hmm. went down to several meetings and so on, but uh, I don't think it's changed that much. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What, if any, enduring qualities do Hoosiers have or hold dear? Is there anything that makes Hoosiers unique? I have a sister who lives up in Michigan. I have a sister who lives out in California. And 
I don't see any difference. Okay. <laughs> Them out there, or, you know, me here. Okay. Um, well, I think that really takes us through a majority of my questions here. Um, is there anything I haven't asked that you would want to talk about or any experiences that we haven't covered? No, I think we covered pretty good. <laughs> pretty thorough there. That was a lot of questions. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for taking the time to, well, to talk with me and share your experiences. Mm -hmm. And you have amazing resources that mm -hmm. both you and your wife collected. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, like I said, I don't think I have any other questions, but if you're comfortable with signing the consent form, if there's anything you want me to cut or take no. off the record, I'm happy to do that. Then I don't think I'll get hung for anything. No, I, I don't think so either. I think you're pretty clean here. But all right, well, I'll go ahead and stop the recorder then. Okay. Uh, I'll stop this one here.